Have you ever received an apology that felt insincere or fake? Let's start with the first type of fake apology, the blaming apology. This is the type of apology that flips the script, making you the one at fault. Instead of apologizing for their actions, the person says something like, I'm sorry you can't take a joke, or I'm sorry that you find me so difficult. It's an apology that's not really an apology at all. Consider a situation where your colleague consistently misses deadlines, causing you to work late. When confronted, they retort with, I'm sorry you feel I'm not pulling my weight. This isn't an apology for their behavior, but a subtle way of blaming you for feeling frustrated with their lack of responsibility. So why do people give blaming apologies? It's often a defense mechanism. They're trying to protect their self-image, unable to accept their own shortcomings. Instead, they shift the blame onto you, suggesting that you're the one with the problem, not them. Psychologically, this is a form of gaslighting, a manipulative tactic used to make you question your own perception of the situation. It's a common tool in the arsenal of narcissists who use it to protect their fragile egos. So, how do you respond to a blaming apology? It's important not to internalize the blame. Remember, you're not at fault for their actions. You need to be assertive and direct. You might say, I am angry and you don't have to be sorry about that, but we need to talk about what's going on. This shifts the conversation back to their behavior, not your reaction to it. Remember, it's important to stand your ground and not let someone else's inability to take responsibility affect your self-esteem. It's okay to insist on a genuine apology, one that acknowledges the other person's actions without putting the blame on you. Moving on to the second type of insincere apology, we have the tit-for-tat apology. This is a masterclass in negotiation, but not the good kind. The one who owes an apology tries to turn the tables, making their apology conditional on you apologizing first. It's like they're holding their apology hostage, and the ransom is your own admission of guilt. Picture this. You're in a heated argument with your friend. You feel they wronged you, but instead of acknowledging their mistake, they say something like, I'll apologize right now if you agree to let this go. Or even, I want to hear you tell me that you're sorry first. Sounds familiar? That's a classic tit-for-tat apology. But what's happening beneath the surface? Well, it's a classic power play. The person owing the apology seeks to maintain control of the situation. By asking you to apologize first, they're essentially trying to shift the blame, making it seem like you're equally, if not more, at fault. This kind of apology is more about preserving their ego than repairing the relationship. So, how should you respond to a tit-for-tat apology? Remember, you don't owe anyone an apology, especially if you haven't done anything wrong. Don't let the other person dictate the terms of your apology. Instead, stand your ground. You could say something like, this isn't about who apologizes first, it's about understanding what went wrong and how we can avoid it in the future. Try not to get sucked into this game of apology ping pong. This isn't a competition. It's about sincere remorse and making amends. If the other person can't apologize without making it a quid pro quo, then perhaps it's time to reconsider the dynamics of the relationship. The key here is to avoid getting caught up in the game of who apologizes first. Remember, an apology isn't a bargaining chip. It's an admission of wrongdoing, a step towards reconciliation, and a promise to do better. Anything less isn't really an apology at all. The third type of fake apology is a bit more elusive. The phantom apology. It's the spectral specter of remorse, the ghost of a genuine apology, and it can be challenging to identify. A phantom apology often feels forced or scripted, as though the person apologizing is merely reciting lines from a play. They might seem eager to get the apology over with, giving the impression that they're more interested in ending the uncomfortable situation than in addressing the issue at hand. Another telltale sign is the timing. A genuine apology usually follows soon after the offending action, propelled by a sense of guilt or regret. However, a phantom apology often comes much later at a point when the narcissist feels cornered and wants to escape the discomfort rather than out of genuine remorse. The body language during a phantom apology also tends to be incongruous. 
The words might be right, but the non-verbal cues often tell a different story. They might smile while expressing regret, or their eye contact might be too intense or too evasive. Overall, a phantom apology just feels hollow. It's like a beautifully wrapped present that turns out to be empty. Even if you can't pinpoint exactly why, it just doesn't feel genuine or sincere. Navigating a phantom apology can be tricky. It's the easiest to deny, but it also forms a significant part of the dynamic in a narcissistic relationship. If you keep receiving such apologies, it's time to reevaluate your relationship. What are you gaining from this dynamic? What do you hope to change? You might find that the best course of action is to create some distance. This could mean limiting contact or avoiding certain topics of conversation. In response to a phantom apology, trust your instincts. If it feels insincere, it probably is. Don't be afraid to address the issue directly and ask for a more genuine apology. The phantom apology can be tricky to navigate, but remember to trust your instincts and evaluate your relationship with the person offering such an apology. Lastly, let's talk about the blanket statement apology. This is the type of apology where the offender, usually a narcissist, tries to cover all their wrongdoings with a single vague apology. It's like they're tossing a blanket over a mess, hoping it will magically disappear. But we all know that's not how it works. To paint a clearer picture, let's use a real-life example. Consider the statement, I'm sorry I'm such a bad friend and never make you happy. It's broad, it's sweeping, and it's designed to cover a multitude of sins. The problem with this kind of apology is that it avoids addressing any specific issue. It's a clever diversion, a smokescreen that hides the real issues at hand. Now why would someone resort to a blanket statement apology? Well, it's a classic move by narcissists who find it difficult to confront their mistakes. It's a defense mechanism, an attempt to protect their ego from the harsh reality of their actions. They'd rather generalize their offenses than face each one head on. But how should you respond to a blanket statement apology? The key here is to not get lost in the vastness of the apology. It's important to stay focused on the specific issue that needs addressing. You could respond by saying, I appreciate your apology, but right now, I want to talk about this particular incident. Remember, it's not about the number of issues being apologized for, but the sincerity and the willingness to make amends that truly counts. So, don't be swayed by the grandiosity of a blanket statement apology. Instead, seek a genuine, heartfelt apology that addresses the issue at hand. In response to a blanket statement apology, it's important to remain focused on the issue at hand. And that's a wrap on today's session on fake apologies. Stay tuned for part three, where we'll explore the martyr apology among others.